Kata Mirza. Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim <coughs> Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihil karim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And very good to everyone uh, First of all, on behalf of LEAD Institute for Leadership and Development Studies And also our uh, partners for this uh, forum uh, ABIM, uh, IDE and also Istanbul Network We would like to thank you everyone for for making your time uh, to be here uh, in the forum that we named uh, in conjunction of our friend's book, uh, Islamic Foundations of a Free Society. This was uh, published by Institute of Economic Affairs in United Kingdom uh, late last year. And uh, Dr. Mazli is also one of the co-author of the book. And uh, on behalf of LEAD, we also like to thank our three panels here. Uh, so I would briefly introduce each one of them. Uh, on my far right, <laughs> on my far right is Ali Salman. is the CEO of Istanbul Network. And he is also the research manager at Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs Ideas. Uh, Ali was with Prime in Pakistan, which is the, 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 the think tank in Pakistan. He was the founder of Prime, but now he's attached. Uh, he's based in Kuala Lumpur. And on my right side is, is, is a well-known uh, political scientist in Malaysia. One of the well-known political scientists is Dr. Mazli Malik uh, from IIUM. International Institute, uh, Inter International Islamic University of Malaysia, and and on my left is uh, brother Muhammad Faisal bin Abdul Aziz, is the Secretary General of ABIM. Okay, uh, so our forum today will be conducted in bilingual, uh, since we have uh, international speaker here, one of international speaker here. So I hope that everyone don't mind if. Uh, we, we, I mean, if if you have a questions, let, any questions later, you can also uh, convey your question in uh, Malay language. Okay. So uh, for the start, I would like to invite uh, Brother Ali Salman, uh, since he's the CEO of the Istanbul Network, which is a partner with the IEA, who is a uh, producer uh, who. Uh, Produced this book last year, so maybe he can. Uh, he he also conducted a series of of discussion with international uh, participants uh, via online, eh? online online seminar. I mean the webinar. So maybe he can share a bit about this book and also about Istanbul Network. So please. Thank you so much, um, Amin. Uh, <laughs> pleasure to be here. Um, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum and salamat sadatra, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here to start discussion about um, uh, Islam and uh, free society topic um, in this holy month. Um, and um, what I'm going to do, do in a few minutes uh, initially is uh, just uh, lay a down basic introduction of Istanbul Network of Liberty and uh, the background of this book um, and uh, basic themes. Uh, anything then then will be taken up by maybe more discussion uh, later on. Um, so um, Istanbul Network of uh, Liberty, um, as the name uh, suggests, um, was set up uh, in Istanbul um, in 2011. Um, and uh, were you there in that meeting? You were not. Um, but Masli Malik has been, uh, you know, since early days has been with us. Um, uh, one Saiful Wanjan, whom probably you know uh, very well, also in in Malaysia, uh, myself, um, and many other think tank leaders uh, from the Muslim countries uh, got together in Istanbul um, in 2011 talking about um, the, the democracy, talking about uh, economic freedom, free markets, religious freedom, personal freedom, 
um, in the context of Islam. And um, uh, there were about uh, 55 members in, uh, present in that meeting. Uh, that was a special meeting of another international society called Mon Pelerin Society. But uh, since most of us in that meeting were from the Muslim countries, uh, we concluded <clears throat> on that day that we should start discussion uh, in our respective countries about uh, issues which concerns Islam and society, um, particularly from uh, a libertarian or a liberal perspective. And um, you know, since then, we what we have organized is is one international conference every year. We have organized four international conferences in five years. Last year, there was no international conference. Um, and this uh, in, this network has mostly existed as an informal uh, network of individuals and organizations. Uh, till last year, in September 2016, um, after a long uh, registration and legal process, it was uh, formally established uh, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, as a foundation. So Istanbul Network, uh, the name is Istanbul. Um, I'm from Pakistan and it is a headquarter in Malaysia. Uh, truly embodiment of you know the global spirit behind this initiative. Um, and its main purpose is to um, promote um, and explore the, not just promote but also explore the values of freedom within the Islamic framework um, and talk about Muslim societies um, in, in general. Uh, within within the context of Islamic history and within the context of um, Islamic um, religion and code of life itself, so that's the that's very and there is a website um, istanbulnetwork.org. Um, we are organizing our fifth national uh, international conference inshallah in Kuala Lumpur uh, in November later this year, uh, um, and the theme is also very pertinent. Um, the theme is democratic transitions in the Muslim world. So, so this is the theme in which we are uh, already receive, have received uh, quite a number of good uh, abstracts and presentations from different countries. So you will hear, uh, if you decide to participate in that conference, perspectives from South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Central Asia, Middle East, um, Africa, also Europe and USA talking about uh, the democratic transitions, uh, especially post-Arab Spring, which is very, of course, important. Um, events in last five years democratic has um, uh, they have unfolded among, uh, before us. Which is very, which is very no, important. Uh, let me come directly to the topic itself, uh, <coughs> the theme of today's uh, <coughs> seminar, uh, Islamic Foundations of a Free Society, which is also a title of the book. <coughs> So, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, you know, uh, before I introduce you to the book, I will just uh, present before you three or four questions. <coughs> um, and um, I don't mean to uh, impose the answers to those questions, but I, I hope that th those questions uh, remain with you. That's, that's my, my uh, objective. Um, we can differ on the answers itself, but I hope that you will see that those, uh, those questions are important. So, uh, first of all, as uh, citizens of Muslim and Islamic societies, um, in which Muslims are majority, you know, a question which I normally ask um, myself and all others whom we interact in these discussions is what kind of society do we want to live in? What will be the features of that society? Uh, do we want a society which offers uh, economic potential for everyone, regardless of the background of race, of color, of religion? Uh, do we want a society in which there are equal human rights available? Do we want a society um, in which certain, or do we want a society in which certain classes are preferred over others? Um, 
do we want a society in which political freedom is available to everyone or do we want a society which is more uh, authoritarian in nature um, do we want a society in which uh, women have an equal role and freedom uh, of social mobility of work and of participation in society or do we want a society in which there are restrictions on uh, on women uh, uh, in 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 any name uh, so what kind of society do we live uh, do we want to live in uh, what what should be the vision of such a society um, in um, you know and when i was looking around uh, this this concept of you know this ideal muslim society i i came across a very interesting index you might have heard of uh, this index is called islamicity index uh, and uh, in that index uh, you know similar questions are raised what is the ideal islamic society um, and um, and you, you I, and what are the ideal islamic cities for that matter um and if you go through the list islamic city index list uh you will realize very soon that first 30 names in the cities uh is actually non islamic countries <laughs> uh and if if i remember correctly the first muslim or islamic city which comes under that list on the top is Kuala Lumpur. Uh, number 32 in that list, but number one in the Islamic world. Huh? So, so Kuala Lumpur is number 32 in that list, uh, but there are 31 cities, more Islamic cities than Kuala Lumpur which are in mostly in Europe, in USA, in Canada and di different other parts of the world. So um, there, there, is a, there, there are challenges which are, disc you know, there are issues in human rights, there are issues in governance, issues of corruption, issues of you know, ba basic education and health not being there. There are so many challenges with the society space. But you can, you can still say that, okay, this is, this, if, if we want to live in an Islamic society, these are the features uh, which we need to adopt. Um, uh, and so, so this is a question for us. What kind of society do we want to live in? The second question uh, before uh, I want to present before you is that what is this freedom and liberty we are talking about? Um, we are going to talk about free society today. So what is this word freedom coming from? Um, and what do we mean by that? Uh, is this freedom uh, a divine order, a divine product, or a social product? Is it a, a relationship between man and God, or woman and God for that matter? Or is it a relationship between man to man, human and social relationship? And um, you know, again, uh, I, I, uh, there are discussion between philosophers on how to define freedom. Uh, and I've seen that in many discussion when we especially um, uh, hold in context of Islam, the discussion immediately goes to values and morality. And we are saying that, okay, freedom means free to do everything. Freedom means liberalism. That means immorality. You know, these kind of uh, associated perceptions come come very quickly in our minds um, uh, however uh, there is another uh, concept of freedom which we will often relate to um, uh, it, technically it is called negative freedom but 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 I would try to put it very simply that this is essentially freedom from coercion of others freedom from interference of others so that's the kind of freedom we are talking about. These others can be other individuals, groups of individuals, and governments. So we are talking about individual freedom as the cornerstone of this idea of freedom. 
which means that uh, that individual is uh, is able to make the choices uh, in his or her own capacity without being imposed uh, by anyone from outside. Uh, outside can be an individual, a social institution, a religious institution, a government institution, anything which imposes restrictions on individuals um, is in my view, um, um, uh, will, will reduce the level of individual freedom. Um, and indeed, what, whenever we talk about freedom, we should actually, in my humble opinion, we should talk about freedom only in this context whether as individuals uh, we are allowed to exercise the choices we make or not. Um, and the associated concept of uh, responsibility, that's my third sort of point here, is that um, can we be held responsible for our actions without being free? If we are not free, uh, morally, then we should not be held responsible. So therefore, to be held responsible to others in terms of rights, in terms of um, uh, our um, responsibilities, obligation to other, we should have that freedom of choice first of all. Um, and only then we can actually define our level of responsibility. So to be responsible, I think we have to be free first of all. Uh, and by freedom, as I said, my own sort of understanding is this freedom from coercion of others. And um, question number four, um, which is which is also I think very pertinent to to this discussion, and and the book itself, is that in this context of freedom and free society, and Islam. Um, is Islam solely an ethical system or both an ethical and a political system? So if I offer these two choices before you, uh, do we take Islam as just an ethical system? A uh, system comprises which, you know, principles, value, values, uh, moralities, uh, rights of God, rights of man. So this is you know, uh, Islam as ethical system, or it is something else also, which is the claim of uh, so many modern Islamist uh, scholars, Islamic uh, political parties today, that they say not not okay, uh, they say that Islam is not just an ethical system, but it is also an ethical and a political system. Um, and to, to my mind, uh, when we, when we uh, believe that Islam is both a political and ethical system, uh, the, we run into a potential problem or we run into a potential conflict. And that conflict, is, uh, that conflict arises because uh, we differ in our understanding of Islam itself each of us. In this room, 25 people, let's say, would differ on what do we mean by Islam. And if we go outside this room, uh, we meet people from different uh, walks of life, different schools of thought, you will see each of us would differ on how to build uh, an Islamic-based political system. Because the way we understand Islam may not be the same as you uh, or others would understand. So it means that a, in a society which wants to live in a, in a, in a framework um, of equality, the, the conflict can arise if we restrict ourselves uh, to a political system and, and claim that this, uh, this particular brand of political system is Islamic and others are, are non-Islamic. So if, um, if we have a choice between um, these two uh, options, Islam as a political and ethical system and Islam as an ethical system, so maybe uh, taking Islam as an ethical system uh, may be more accommodative 
for for all of us uh, when we particularly talk about um, uh, as a society in which we want to respect uh, others views um, and I'd like to uh, quote something from the book uh, a short paragraph here which explains this point this is from the first essay um, and this also captures I think main theme here stated differently rather than establishing a free world based on an Islamic understanding of positive freedom a free world based on a negative understanding of freedom that accommodates different values must be established and in the Islamic world nationalism socialism and tribalism have all been tried the only way not uh, tried yet is free market liberalism and um, you know we think that it's time for Muslims to discover these liberal values and to look for support for them in Allah's small and big books uh, you will need, need to read this essay to understand what the authors mean by the, the, these, these words but I think this is important um, to sort of set the um, framework of this uh, discussion Islam uh, and free society uh, it was under this background then uh, then we actually um, uh, partnered with uh, this Institute of Economic Affairs based in England uh, the the essays uh, you will see in this book uh, are mostly uh, those essays, uh, essays which were presented in our conferences as I mentioned in the start the, we have organized international conference every year and um, uh, so m m most of these essays come from those conferences you will you will see uh, essays on on political situation you will see essays on um, the intellectual outlook um, discussion between reason and tradition uh, free will versus uh, fate um, you will also see an essay by Masli Malik uh, about Islamic understanding of uh, welfare um, then uh, essay on freedom of choice as explained in Quran itself then economic freedom with respect to women in, in emancipation um, also a couple of essays on uh, political change and jihad itself uh, and lastly Islam and free market economy which is my personal interest um, uh, so you, you know what we we have tried to do is we have tried to explain uh, some of the basic fundamental principles of a free society um, uh, in the Islamic context which uh, for us um, the Istanbul network and, and the founders um, holds key to uh, the peace uh, stability and prosperity in the Muslim world and the world overall thank you so much thank you Ali for uh, quite in-depth introduction uh, about the book and Istanbul Network <coughs> uh, to, to the audience that you can download this book for free it's online you just search the, the same title Islamic Foundation of a Free Society and besides that, whoever registered downstairs just now, you ca you should get a copy of CD. I mean, in this CD, they include uh, more than 100 free ebooks on uh, free market economy, on the on the freedoms, and and a lot of discussion on on political economy. Also, and it all uh, all of uh, the ebook uh, got a permission from the the origi either original author or the original publisher. So. Uh, we will go to the, our, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Mazli Malik. Uh, just now I just have a quick search on Google about uh, Mazli Malik and uh, you can see uh, he wrote uh, diverse uh, issues in the Islamic world and he also uh, published uh, is it a thesis or a book on the foundation of Islamic governance which is I think have a lot to do with freedom, issue of freedom, and one of the presentation that he did in Singapore is on the increasing religious tolerance and how is, is it right. So perhaps the, the tolerance itself 
can be a restriction to freedom. Maybe I don't know. I mean, that's what I I I I, I think. I mean, <laughs> just now maybe maybe Dr. Mazli can explain a bit more about about the uh, about the subject. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amin. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, dear panelists, Ali, Amin, uh, Waibizu, and respected audience. Uh, actually, the, the the paper that I've written is not about tolerance, it's about the level of intolerance <laughs> of of religiosity that yeah, we are living in Malaysia we now. To tolerate. Sometimes we <laughs> we. Yeah, we have to sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, I could, I couldn't disagree with that. But anyway, I hate the word tolerance very much because the word tolerance is not a, is not an accurate word to 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 be used when we, we're dealing with uh, social social cohesion and coexist coexistence. But rather, the word uh, mutual respect should be used instead because when we're talking about mutual respect. There is a, I think, a huge room for freedom, I suppose, <laughs> in compared to tolerance. Because you, when you tolerate something, you are being forced to tolerate it. You don't like it, just like you tolerate medicine. You don't like the medicine, but you you need to take it. So when it comes to uh, social cohesion, when it comes to you know uh, peaceful living, coexistence. Uh, Tolerance is not enough. You, you cannot continuously hating others, but you need to accept them because that is the reality. No, we have to start with the very foundation of uh, humanity that Islam has instilled. That been mentioned by Sayyidina Ali. He said that uh, your the the believers are your brethren or your brothers in uh, in Islam, whereas the non-believers or the non-Muslim those are your brothers in humanity and you know in, in Surah Al-Hujurat verse 13 clearly said that Allah SWT has created a uh, human being uh, in, in, in many uh, in various backgrounds races, tribes and etc. for us to mutually learning from each other Lita Arafu so you know, a great example has been shown by Rasulullah Sallallahu how uh, he deal with, you know, the, the Jewish tribes, the Halil Kitab, and even the non-Muslims, Arabs, Badwins who came to live in Medina, who came to see him in Medina. The level of respect, the level of love, the level of humane in, 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 in his relation with, with them, even to the extent that when a a corpse of uh, a Jew, you know, uh, being carried on the street of Medina, he stood up and giving his respect, uh, as showing his respect to that. And the companions was were confused and asked him, "He said to oh, Rasulullah, he's a non-believer, he's a Jew." You know, a typical mentality that we adopt nowadays. Whenever you heard the word Jew, Yahudi, we would say Laknatullah. Eh? So that he's, he's a Jew. Oh, oh, <coughs> oh Messenger of God, he's a Jew. And, and Rasulullah replied to him by saying that Allah is nafsan. Uh, but it's a life, the appreciation of life. But nowadays we would see people chanting the name of God, Allahu Akbar, and you know, trying to, 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 to say that they're following the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but they have no respect for life. They're taking up innocent people's life and chanting, Allah is the great. <laughs> and, 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 and proudly saying that they are following the Sunnah of Rasulullah which they are living far away from Sunnah of Rasulullah But anyway, uh, why did you ask me that question? I, I suppose we're going to talk about this book instead. <laughs> so, uh, this book is very interesting. So, not because I'm one of the contributors, <laughs> but it is going to disappoint you. You know, normally when I got involved, this is, uh, you know, uh, why should I put myself in, in, in this great misery? You know, involving with ideas, Istanbul Network, and IRF, this forum. Because, you know, the word liberal will be frequently uttered. 
and this is a framework of this book. And the word liberal is taboo, full stop, in this country. Uh, but again, when you look at this book and when you try to understand the connotation of red liberal that have been proposed in this book, you'll be disappointed. Yes, it talks about Islamic foundations of a free society, but it doesn't talk about free sex, unfortunately. Uh, there's no discussion about LGBT. I suppose, did, did we ever talk about LGBT in our conferences? No, we never. Uh, did we ever talk about, you know, <coughs> perennialism? But here, would they call it pluralism? La? Saying that, okay, all religion leads to one God in different forms, or every uh, prophet or whatever, they are uh, conveying this. No, no, no. Unfortunately, we are not messing ourselves with all those topics. Uh, I'm sorry, Jaes, Mu'es, and Jakim. Okay, uh, free to drink. Uh, I, as far as concerned, in our conferences, we never. No, we never. We never. Okay, <laughs> and even some of our friends from from the states, yeah. some of them they, they don't drink. They're churchgoers. But anyway, so no, no, we don't talk about that. And we are talk when we are talking about liberal here. It's mostly based on economic framework or political economic framework. It's about free market, like uh, Ali mentioned earlier. It's about individual freedom, where nobody or no party or no power could coerce them or could force them to adopt a certain way in conducting their life, in conducting their economic life, in spending their money or in earning their money. I mean, yes, they have values, but values is based on their personal choice. They're doing it because they believe that is the right thing to do, not because somebody else telling them what to do and not what to do. And it's about free market. We're talking about free market. Sometimes people have inside their mind, free market is all about greed. It's all about that bloody, greedy capitalists. Rich become richer and poor will be discriminated. No, no, it's about you are free to generate your income according to free exchange, according to whatever way you like to earn your income, but but there are certain uh, you know, regulations to it. There's no monopoly. Monopoly is not allowed. You know, fraudulence and a cartel. <laughs> <laughs> the word cartel is very scandalous. <laughs> okay, uh, and and there should be no, you know, uh, uh, what uh, stealing and immoral activities and etc. If the car, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> so and and you find it, it shares a lot of uh, similar values with Islam. And when you're talking about liberal, is also about minimizing the state. Because when the state is too big, it will, it will lead individuals to the road of serfdom. They're becoming slaves, slaves of the state. Because we believe that when the state is too big, the state is too powerful, they have a potential to become Firaun. Abuse power. Okay. So, free market is all about you know, minimizing the state, living... Uh, the the economy to the market to determine and uh, empowering the society they believe in big society or what I coin in my chapter as benevolent society when it comes to welfare they don't believe somebody saying or the state is saying that we know the best on how you should spend your money we know the best what people's need we know the best on how you can help others no what we means by you know minimal state uh, big society or empowered society is society knows better how to conduct themselves individuals were born with good intention they know how to conduct better but despite of the freedom of individuals we do liberalism in terms of economy does believe in rule of law this is the difference between liberal economy and anarchism or liberal politics and anarchism because normally when you talk about liberal 
people have you know thousand interpretation of liberal you can do anything they said oh you want liberal then you know you can do anything anything goes no that is not what we understand in the framework of economy not what we understand in the framework of politics you know it is kind of uh, ironic certain people they said oh liberalism is is dangerous liberal is dangerous but yet they belong to certain political parties in which political parties could only exist could only exercise its rights within the framework of liberal democracy otherwise it, it would be a one party system otherwise it would, it would be a non party system okay. so if you are already the absolute monarchy if you are already in a political party be you a democratic party be you uh, an islamic party whatever you are already in the realm of liberalism so it's very ironic when you reject something uh, as if you you are working in silo and separated from that reality yeah. so that that is what we mean by uh, uh, liberal here so the word liberal has been mentioned a lot in this book but but then another thing i would like to point out uh, about this book is it's not a religious book unfortunately again we have to disappoint you uh, we don't deal with theological issues although there's one chapter yeah mustafa azhar 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 also deal with yeah with freedom of choice yeah but but again it's not purely theological because both of them they are from economic background and and, and they are looking at it from purely economic framework uh, yeah yeah with excep exception of mustafa ajar he he did pointed out few controversial issues with uh, in which i personally disagree because he's not an expert of that theological issues it's very deep and he took it just like that which i think everybody uh, I mean that's mistake anyway but apart from that the rest of the book are talking about political economy even when although we have two articles or two chapters dealing with jihad but again it's within the political framework so when you look at this book it's about how to bring the liberal political economy uh, realm within or how to reconcile it with islamic values you wouldn't find any theological purely theological discussion in this book and you wouldn't find any legal juristic discussion fiqh discussion tak ada dalam ni even myself although i'm from fiqh background but i chose not to use a fiqh approach when dealing with political economic issue it might sound controversial because people say oh ini jadi sekular nanti when it come to political economy you're not you're not using your fiqh no one thing we need to understand because we have this pusat kajian maqasid eh? in 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 in, in al-muwafaqat al-shatibi when he talk about islam he differentiate between two things he said there are realm of ibadat and there are realm of adat there are realm of muamalat where you you it uh, it is about uh, human uh relation with one another and another part is about human relation with god when it comes to human relation with god is fixed you need to abide the rule you need to abide the you know a very straight jacket uh, uh regulations but, but when we when it come to the issues of adat or muamalat there's a huge room for ijtihad especially when it comes to politics I still remember a very interesting book written by uh, the current Prime Minister of Morocco, Saadudin Usmani. It's been translated into English, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a chapter of that book. It is about uh, Asiyasa uh, Wuddin Tamyizun La Faslun. Uh, politics and uh, religion differentiation and not separation because as muslims we cannot separate ourselves <coughs> from religion totally but how we inculcate religion 
into reality, into realm of politics, into realm of economy? Okay, we come back to the question that being imposed earlier by Ali. Are we looking at Islam as a set of values, ethos, you know, moral that guide us in doing our ishtihad, guiding us in choosing the best for Muslims and the best for the community? Or is it a structured, systematic, uh, let we say, ordinance? So, majority of Muslims, majority of scholars, and actually it's not contemporary scholars, even during the day of, even in the classical period, we would have this, uh, the, the, the author of uh, Kitab al-Furuq, al-Qarafi, one of the Maliki Mazab, great scholar, he has written a book in differentiation between Prophet's actions as a Nabi, as a messenger, and prophet's actions as a leader of a state, as a judge, and as a politician. So, you know, most of scholars nowadays, most of contemporary scholars, when they're looking at it, they're saying that, okay, Islam is a set of values, set of guidance, uh, moral, and ethos to guide us in our political, economic reality. But I wouldn't deny the Islamists the let we say the the core islamists be them the jihadis be them the the salafis whatever some of them still believe that is islam provides us with a structured system of politics and economies that should be implemented in whatever context we're living in but again they're contradicting themselves because you would see if you ask them which political system are you following? Is it the Nabhani, his Butahrils? Or is it the Maududis? Or is it the Said Qutubs? Is it the Hassan al-Banna? Or is it whose political system are you talking about? Whose economic system are you talking about? Even among themselves, they have different model, uh, models and they have different systems. So, again, in this book, I think it was, who was talking about that? Muqtadar? No, it was not Muqtadar. There's one chapter uh, dealing with the issue of but never mind, you can read it later. <laughs> I couldn't recall. Uh, dealing with the issue of how we look at Islam when it comes to the political economic issues. Is it a realm of ishtihad where Muslims are left with their choice to perform ishtihad, to explore new things, but within the epistemology of Islam or is it implementing the literal meaning of Quran or Sunnah and trying to impose what have been said uh, by the scholars in the past 1400 years ago, 1300 years ago, 1200 years ago and trying to impose it in a totally different reality. Okay, I think that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Adam Azli for another in-depth discussion about this topic and our third speaker for today Saudara Faisal Abdul Aziz the Secretary General of ABIM the reason why I invited Faisal because uh, Faisal wrote several articles on on Islam and freedom and one of the title if I remember correctly is the the revival of Islamism uh, the future of Islamic revival is in freedom so Maybe and Faisal because he's also a young activist. Maybe I mean young people who are exposed to different setting, different technology development. I mean, so they might have different ideas about how freedom can work in the Muslim world. So please, Faisal. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Brother Amin Ahmad, acting as moderator today. Uh, respected counterpart Dr. Mazli and Dr. Ali. Uh, both are PhD holders, by the way, and I'm not PhD holder, so I leave uh, many things about uh, the discussion of uh, today uh, to both of them to discuss in depth. But I will try to uh, give uh, some views about freedom and Islam that we should or we need to ponder upon. But uh, all right, um, first of all, uh, when we talk or when we use the term of freedom and Islam, it is not just a matter of uh, text or just a matter of uh, something that we have a discourse but more than that it is a matter of how do we give life to that term 
they give life to the term of freedom in Islam. And one of the things I think uh, that we can give life to the term of freedom and in Islam is to give freedom to the people or to the Muslim to use their mind. Because in order to give, uh, in, in order to give life to the people, we have to appreciate the mind uh, that Allah had given to us. So, I would like to uh, use one caption. I think all of us, all of us uh, agree. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibits us from downgrading our intellectual capacity. Or in bahasa mungkin agak kasar, Allah melarang kita untuk membodohkan akal kita. So, uh, if we can uh, agree with this caption, so that means we are moving forward to give life to the term of freedom and Islam. All right. When we talk about how uh, Allah SWT prohibits us from downgrading our intellectual capacity, let's have a look at in depth through the history of Islam. The history prior to Islam and the history. Uh, the day of Islam brought by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where we can see it was a societal transformation during the Jahiliyyah period there was a uh, full of ignorance maybe intolerant <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, we can say uh, uncivilized and a close-minded society all the way but the period during uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, after Islam it was a societal tra transformation to be more free society, more acceptance, they accept each other. And it is not just a matter of transformation, uh, but it is a matter of how they transform, how they appreciate the meaning of freedom in a society. So by having or by pointing out this kind of uh, caption and history, let's have a ch check on ourselves. When we become more Islamic, after attending uh, charama or seminar and so on, when we become more Islamic, more religious, does it mean that we become more free? I mean, more. Uh, does it mean that we become the people who appreciate freedom more when we become more religious, or vice versa? When we become more religious, when we become more Islamic, does it mean that we tend to be more extreme? in tackling the issue, social issues, religious issue because we are defensive for example so as our non-Muslim brothers or non-Muslim friends or newly converted Muslim when they embrace Islam does it mean that they got something sort of enlightenment that could appreciate the meaning of freedom more when they know Islam or vice versa when they embrace Islam they go to jihad they kill innocent body, in, in, innocent person and so on so let's have a check on ourselves. Supposedly, when we become more Islamic, more religious, we tend to be respecting the freedom, the freedom of choice, or the freedom of the community to make a choice, for example. And let's take uh, an example during the Prophet period, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the companions of Sahabah embraced Islam. It was not just a matter of embracing Islam, but it was a uh, life-changing experience it was a life-changing experience on the top of which a gift they got something gift from Allah as a matter of freedom to live their life so let's have a check on, on ourselves how do we appreciate freedom when we become more Islamic when we become more religious in our religion and that's the matter I think on how do we give the life to the term of freedom and Islam but uh, nevertheless uh, however if we discuss about the issue of freedom in Islam or any discourse mainly uh, organized by mainstream maybe government the, the element or the the element of freedom always being demonized I think Dr. Madli has said just now uh, liberal the term of liberal liberty freedom always be demonized even human rights defender always label as anti-Islam. Uh, that's a problem. Western yeah, Western ideas, Westernize the community, the Muslim community in the Malaysia, uh, not 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 just in Malaysia, but uh, for the world. I think instead, as I said just now, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibits us from downgrading our intellectual capacity. 
Uh, supposedly, when we become more Islamic, we have to be more open-minded people. We can appreciate differences in terms of academic writing. Uh, we can debate each other in a conducive manner, not vice versa. And even uh, that's why, uh, as a reason, I think it is must for us to ascertain the exact, the real meaning of Islam. Because now we have many versions, many interpretations about the definition of Islam. And some could be said, uh, defined by the person who subscribe subscribing the extreme ideas. So we follow the definition of Islam uh, articulated by them. But some may be quite contemporary, like Sheikh Arai Sunni. I think Dr. Mazli known, uh, he, he knows better Arai Sunni and so on. But uh, there is one definition that really appealed to me. Uh, definition of Islam by Al Al-Fasi, Imam Al Al-Fasi. Uh, he said Islam is a religion of fitrah mu'allal. Fitrah mu'allal means Islam is in accordance with the nature, giving respect to the reasoning and thinking. Because one of the nature of the people, human being, is to think. If you ask somebody to do us a favor, for example, of course, certainly they will ask the reason behind. Because people, naturally, they tend to think, what is the reason behind? Or otherwise, I will not do the thing that without purpose. That's why Islam came with the reason. And according to Imam al Fasi, when he said Islam is a religion of Fitra Mu'allal, if we read the Quran, any text, any orders or prohibitions given by Allah in the text, in the Quran, comes with, together with the reason. And that's why we call as Maqasa Syariah. And Dr. Mazli also mentioned about Pusat Kajian Maqasa Syariah. It is important for us to analyze the importance, the objective of the Syariah or the reason behind the Syariah. Sadly to say, there is a people or there are groups of people uh, demonize this kind of term Makasa Sharia as if that we are rejecting the text. That's wrong. Because if we discuss about the reason why we perform prayer, for example, Salah, does it mean that we are rejecting the Salah? Whereas in the Quran, Allah clearly mentioned the objective of Salah. For example, Allah said in the Quran, Wa akhimi salata li zikri. You have to perform the prayer, you have to perform the salah to remember me. That's the maqasid of the salah. So, is it wrong to discuss about the objective of sharia? To think, to be a reasonable person, why do we perform salah or prayer? Because Allah SWT clearly mentioned in the Quran, the maqasid of the salah. Wa aqimi salata li zikri. Same goes to fasting, for example. Now we are fasting, alhamdulillah. Allah clearly mentioned the reason behind why we are fasting to upgrade our level to be muttaqin, to be the highest level among the people. So there is nothing wrong for us to use our mind, to use our brain, to use our intellectual capacity to understand Islam more. Because it is clearly mentioned in the Quran. And it is not a matter of how do we want to reject um, the text or reject the Sharia and so on. And in fact, Imam Shatibi in Muafaqat uh, said the importance of uh, thinking, the reason behind the Sharia, to release is to release human beings from the shackles of nafs and to become the best servant of the God voluntarily. We as a human being, we can be the servant of God, servant of Allah voluntarily after we can find peace in our heart. The reason behind why Islam uh, said, that, uh, said this and that. And even Imam Arai Sunni, for example, in his book, uh, Al-Fikr Al-Maqasidi, mentioned uh, or outlined the three important things about how do we think or reasoning the idea of Sharia, for example. First, to answer the criticism of Tohma. Now, when we refrain ourselves from discussing uh, the, the, the thing that uh, I could say contemporary uh, matters to be discussed by non muslim it is something uh, backlash to us because we fail to answer some of the criticism of Tohma uh, given by uh, maybe liberals or the non muslim and so on. Secondly, Litatwa'in al Qulu. Because after we know the reason behind the Sharia, for example, the reason behind the text, after we use our mind that granted by Allah, 
then our heart will find peace. And the third is tahsiniyat. After we know the reason why Allah asked us to do something, then we will perform a certain thing in the best, at the best way. Tahsiniyat. I could give an example. For example, the quality of prayer for those who know the objective of prayer is different from the one who pray without knowing the objective behind uh, or the or uh, why Allah asks us to pray. If we know the objective of prayer to remember Allah, then we will perform the prayer in a good way, in the best way. Maybe we, we will take a shower in the, uh, at the first, in the first place. We go to the mosque, for example. We pray at the conducive area rather than just perform just as a matter to abide the rule uh, given by Allah SWT. And the same goes to fasting. If you know, if you really know the meaning, the reason behind fasting by using our aqal, by, by using our, uh, our mind, for example. So, of course, the quality of fasting will be different will be different from the fasting of the person who just abide by the rule or the law given by Allah in the Quran and uh, touching on the economic or social or political same goes to Sharia for example if we want to say about the, the controversial issue of hudud for example if we know the reason behind why we need hudud for example to achieve justice so we will do our best by exploring, by conducting research, by fulfilling the prerequisite element before implementing hudud, for example. We have to look in depth on the issue of social welfare, economic problem, poverty, the issue of uh, understanding of the people, education level of the people, and so on and so forth. So, by, by referring back to my first statement, in order to give the freedom, in order to give life to the freedom term in Islam, we have to give or we have to grant freedom for the people, for the Muslim to use their mind. It is a matter how how do we appreciate our mind to under Islam to, to under to understand Islam more. Or otherwise we will shut every controversial thing to be discussed and we will just leave any controversial things uh, not to be discussed and leave to the other generation to discuss and we leave that burden from being discussed so in other words it is a matter on how do we, do we appreciate our mind and how do we give our life to this kind of uh, freedom and how do we avoid Islam from being manipulated by the oppressive rulers for example in this, uh, if you want to touch a bit about politics because as a matter of fact it was religion was used to manipulate to justify the action of the regime the ruling regime for example during the period of Christendom where the Christian theologists for example failure, failure to appreciate failure to give freedom for the Christian community to use their mind. So Christian theologies was manipulated by the regime ruling to justify their actions, oppressive action, for example, and in return they were promoted to be high ranking officials of the king, for example. So uh, this is the first, first round, I think. So I leave to moderator. Uh, Okay, thank you, Brother Faisal. Uh, since we don't have so much time, I would like to open questions from audience. And I also have a few questions, I mean, but, but I will let uh, questions coming from uh, audience first, and then we open to our speakers. Any question? You can ask in Bahasa Melayu as well. If any, yeah, please. Tak kenalkan nama, eh? Kalau kita nak deal dengan orang ni Nak siap dia 
uh, ancaman ataupun ke arah kebaikan. So how to deal how to deal with a person in between extremism and secularism. extreme secularism maybe. <laughs> That's one question. Maybe we can collect three questions. Yeah. Uh, Specific. Assalamualaikum. Question to Brother Faisal. You mentioned earlier that we need to grant people freedom in order to for them to uh, execute their function well. Uh, it's specifically when dealing with their ability to think for themselves. So when you talk about granting people freedom, does it mean that we need to be in position of power? Or specifically, how, how, how does a layman, people without power, exercise uh, their, 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 their freedom in order to grant other people freedom? Because as what I understand, if we to grant something to people, we need to be uh, at a status uh, higher than the people that we want to give something. Well, no. Okay, another question? Luqman is now working at the very controversial office, Mufti Wilayah office. Oh. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The question is very much related to what Amin just said. What is your opinion, uh, Dr. Mazli Malik? Regarding the specific government, specific to Mazli, uh, specific to Mazli or maybe uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Faisal maybe can answer. What is your opinion regarding the government-funded uh, religious institution? Is it against uh, the what uh, a liberal uh, uh, promotes, which is the limited government, or not? Thank you. Okay, we have three questions. Eh? Maybe I can add my question. So as as we can see in the in the global or I mean local, especially in Malaysia, we have several groups, I mean so-called so Islamic groups with different interpretation like you know like now in, in Middle East I mean I mean the rulers in Arab, in Bahrain and UAE have different interpretation than maybe the rulers in, in Qatar and even in Malaysia we hear almost every other week or every other month and that uh, even, even the Mufti were not allowed to preach in certain states I mean the level of mufti and alhamdulillah that liberal can still <laughs> can still have a cause there right so I believe that this situation is very much related with the issue of freedom because when we talk about freedom we always associate with with uh, uh, the power that be whether um, in uh, in the political uh, sector or in the religious sector or because in in religious sector have their own specific power that and and um, to relate with Malaysia because the the ruler the king yeah, have the power of a religious institution and we cannot uh, freely say that this religious institution is not dominated by certain people from different groups so it will tend to to uh, string the space for freedom to discuss maybe different interpretation about tax or, or even or even different uh, interpretation based on established Islamic school of thought I mean different mazhab uh, so maybe you can share your opinion about it and how, how to how to move to a better situation if, if, if I can uh quickly maybe share my responses on um, very interesting and I think fundamentally uh, important questions. Um, so the first um, issue, uh, let's say the sort of the religious extremism and extreme secularism, the contrast um, is there. Um, now to, to explain my position I will refer to the, uh, to the political theory of violence. The, the political theory of violence, uh, who has uh, the monopoly of violence? Um, if we accept that uh, there is, there has to be an entity, um, a state, which has the monopoly of violence, um, then, um, then we will also accept the position that no one else should have uh, should have the authority or right 
uh, of violence right so is one thing to preach certain ideas or to share my views about issues uh, of uh, you know let's say dress code for women or uh, islamic finance or whether uh, whether the private uh, you know the like the individual groups can announce jihad on their own without government backing they are all um, issues debatable issues uh, but uh, my view is that um, we should we should give we should keep only uh, you know a government a legitimate government which should have uh, the the monopoly over violence which means that um, if we talk about uh, let's say um, I, I mentioned um, dress code for instance so there are countries in the world um, which impose uh, on women certain dress code uh, and there are countries in the women uh, in the in the world which actually bar or stop women from certain dress codes uh, in my humble opinion uh, both are wrong because it's a matter of personal choice it's a matter of personal choice uh, that uh, women should be allowed to exercise so if you take either extreme i think it's wrong that's that's why i think the middle path uh, the the vastia that that probably is the right in in um, in in my view but absolutely we should uh, we should allow no violence um, on 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 any respect um i just take the liberty of also commenting on one of the like one of the remarks although it was pr uh, probably dr masli is better able to answer that uh, about um uh, religious institution and and the government um and um, i think this is also an important one um and and uh, the the only problem when the government um exercise controls over religious institution is then of course it uh, it also becomes a question of power it's a question of dominance um and uh, therefore i think um we should we should admit that civil society individuals have their space and we should res respect their space as far as religious diversity is concerned as long as we have the uh, in my opinion we have the freedom of interpretation uh, and uh, we are restraining violence freedom is there you can interpret you can talk you can educate but then uh, you cannot be violent you cannot use force uh, over other to enforce your viewpoint i think if if we can respect these conditions the i would i am i am of the opinion that we should allow uh, multi uh, multiple interpretations or uh, the question about power i'm not politician and i'm not standing for the next generation uh apa ni pengumuman awal lah <laughs> alright uh, your question actually has something to do with uh, book the end of power by moses name we have to uh, agree now as a matter of fact you now we are facing the the unpopular of politician uh, sorry uh, i'm back to uh, i'm so sorry uh, okay uh, and now we are facing uh, the era of uh, politician is no longer popular Uh, maybe due to uh, social media and so on but uh, what uh, was said by moses name uh, he articulated uh, he um, his research according to politics economy uh, even churches how uh, the mainstream no longer relevant the institution be deinstitutionalized because of uh, i could say now uh, of the social media and in fact um we can uh make a comparison uh of our country during the era of 1990s of uh, datuk sri mahadi at that time the then prime minister, prime minister it was a strong man leadership it was always a top down policy people of malaysia have to follow abide by any rules any law any policy stipulated by the prime minister 
But uh, as a matter of comparison, if we compare to now, uh, the era is different. The era of government knows best is no longer relevant. It is over. And now, even in fact, uh, Najib announced the Animal Plo just to gather uh, some sort of viewpoint and so on. Because he, I think Prime Minister uh, aware about this kind of uh, transformation about the social, where it is not a matter of top-down policy, but it is how the people's power, the people's view to be heard. It is a matter of how any policy, it is a matter of decision made by the people. Bottom-up policy is not a top-down policy anymore. And in fact, uh, Prime Minister, I think if we live in the era of um, Mahathir, for example, we can imagine how the picture of Prime Minister being demonized, for example. But now it is normal, like Pami Reza, to, uh, I don't know what kind of caricature that he made uh, to the Prime Minister. But, so, uh, as a matter of fact, power is powerless. So, we can decide our future based on ourselves based on our own capacity. We don't have to be politician. We don't have to be uh, prime minister. We have to be cabinet minister. Because we can decide on our own. Because it is now, uh, uh, that uh, said by Moses' name, de-institutionalized. People tend to be, uh, even the youth, for example, they want to have their own personal democracy. Uh, they want to have their own uh, autonomy. That's why even, in fact, not only politics, but also it includes uh, the problem faced by the NGO. They want to do something uh, charitable, for example, um, to help uh, to improve the social welfare. They just do by their own. They gather four people and by using Facebook, WhatsApp, without uh, having registered an NGO, for example. Even if if they want to have some business online, they don't have to register to the SSM, uh, for example. So even they can be richer, they can be millionaire. Uh, yes, they can avoid from being taxed, for example. So uh, this is a, this is an example of a career. So now it is uh, no longer a period of people go to the big company. People be a servant to the big company, <laughs> maybe have some, something to do with the book, uh, but they can decide what they want. Okay, on question of uh, how do we tackle the issue of uh, the two extremes, I think the best uh, is about wasatia, the balance between the two extremes. And for me, uh, Allah clearly mentioned in the Quran, wa kaza lika jalna ko ummat masatoh. Umat uh, wasatiyah, the balance, uh, umat, uh, and, and there was many interpretation about uh, umat wasato. It could be justice, the just people, moderate people, moderate and just balance. But the problem is, uh, the issue is uh, the failure on the part of us or the Islamic scholars to address this kind of issue, to answer the issue. For example, when somebody like liberal. Uh, point out a certain issue, the failure on the part, on our part, to address that kind of issue, to reply, to answer the issue, uh, make things worse. And that's why even uh, Sheikh Arayzuni clearly mentioned the Makosid nowadays is horiyah because the failure of ulama, the scholars, to address Islam as a part of the freedom problem. Uh, as a part of a solution to the freedom pro freedom problem, so we tend to shut the discussion. We tend to uh, have, uh, I could say, outright ban if there is uh, maybe scholars from outside, uh, like even mufti being banned um, freely, for example. So the failure on our part to address the issue, to answer the problem, uh, it will make the things worse. And as a matter of fact, we have to know. The idea can all, can only be killed by idea. If you detain somebody who holding ideas, controversial ideas, the idea still proceeds spread in the society. Hujah hanya boleh dimatikan dengan hujah. Okay, thank you. Okay, before we conclude, maybe any other questions from the audience? <laughs> if there's no question, I will give one final question, then you can answer and also conclude at the same time. So my question is, I mean the 
if you look back in a few years, I mean, few years back, Pew Global have had their own research on on the attitudes among Muslim about the Sharia, about democracy, and the finding that I read from their 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 website, the Pew Global Research, they say that most Muslim wants democracy. They also want uh, political freedom. And at the same time, I mean, a higher number of them also wants a Sharia. Although may, maybe they have a different interpretation of Sharia. Basically, they, they believe that the, the role of religion should be higher. I mean, the, to, to be increased in their, in their political realm. So, how do you see this can... can oh, yeah. yeah, and, okay. Okay, what? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just a very simple question. <coughs> I see there's some confusion between the word liberal and liberated. So I think as Muslim we should be liberated. That's why we have to know, I mean to express our expression, our thinking, our ideas, thinking out of the box. That means liberated. But I think the word liberalism or liberal itself has given the wrong connotation. So much so that liberals, they think that those things that uh, Masli was mentioned, they're very upset not to see in the book, uh, free sex and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think is there, uh, is there a need for us to relook into that terminology so that there wouldn't be any misconception with regards to the liberal liberated Muslim. Eh? So we are the liberated Muslims. But we might not be liberals. Yeah? So I think this is something that uh, you people should uh, think about and uh, maybe you can come up with something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Liberated, liberated from what? Yeah, liberated from uh, as, as, uh, in our democracy system. Eh? Liberated in uh, giving our opinions. Liberated in speech. Liberated in freedom of movement. These are the things that we should be able to go out of that uh, box instead of being uh, too uh, 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 this mentality of uh, uh, psychophantic and uh, also servitude and this sort of things. So, so that these Muslims especially has to be uh, liberated in the thinking. Yeah, but because the word liberals come from the West and when it first started, uh, women liberation. You know, uh, so this has become a negative connotation from the word liberal itself. Okay, that's one thing. Maybe I can I can finish my <laughs> my part. So when uh, maybe people have different connotation about Sharia, but in from the Pew Global Research, they mention that the higher numbers of people, I think it's about 77 uh, percent Muslims in the in the Muslim majority countries want I mean uh, <laughs> Sharia to be implemented. Although they at the same time they also said they want democracy and personal freedom. In a personal, in, in a political freedom, uh, yeah. I mean, how how this can work together? Because it also shows that maybe what they understand about Sharia is very much synonyms to political freedom and and also democracy. Because I always when, when people discuss about hudud, I always say to friends before we discuss about whether you want to chop other people's hand or other things, we should remember that in hudud. We talk about the rights to life. You cannot kill other people freely. It's a rights and uh, property rights. You cannot steal from others. You cannot. Uh, uh, you cannot just break in into other people's property. So, so it's very. To me, this is very the, the fundamentals that that the same. I mean, the same fundamentals with with what uh, with Western ide with Western ideas. But when we discuss about the the approach, the practical, there might be different. So I think maybe that is the, the common ground that we can start. I mean, yeah. maybe we start with Faisal Ali. Yes, okay, uh, well, I could agree with uh, YB is right uh, point of view. Because now, uh, as uh, what we have discussed uh, just now, the term of liberal or Muslim liberal or any any that has something to do with liberal have been demonized or have been uh, uh, label as anti-Islam, so but it is must for us to revive uh, the discourse of freedom and Islam by looking at the kind of context as well. Because, for example, um, I think I could agree with Ashif Bayat when he said about the societal transformation from Islamism to post-Islamism. It is a matter of how do we feed the need of the people. People need to be free. As a matter of comparison, why people 
they tend to be Christian because for them Christian granted freedom for them. Unlike Islam, when they embrace Islam, they have to uh, face some time or some some sort of punishment in the first place. Whereas, as I said just now, uh, in the history of Islam, when the Sahaba companions embrace Islam, the first thing they appreciate is freedom. But we, as a matter of fact, we fail to explain the freedom and Islam in the first place, rather than we prioritizing the element of punishment. Uh, the duties of the people of the Muslim. So, by, by looking at what uh, was said by Isaiah, Bayat, for example, it, is, it was, and in fact it is a societal transformation. People tend to look what they get when they embrace Islam. People tend to look what they get when they holding the idea of Islam. So, uh, that's why uh, Isaiah Bayat came with the term of post-Islamism. We have to we have to emphasize more on the rights that Islam granted to the people uh, rather than duties of the Muslim, and that's why I say it is a must for us to revive the discourse of freedom in Islam. As a matter of fact, now, however, when we talk about freedom, when we talk about Islam and freedom, we always perceive not only liberal but freedom itself as a matter of uh, something that have a negative elements and we always prioritizing the captive term limits heart batas context without looking at the essence of freedom in the first place uh, so if you ask ustaz, ustaz dekat tv dan sebagainya uh, even the mainstream ustaz when we talk about the human rights when we talk about freedom uh, the first thing came into their mind is limitation but they fail to address the issue of freedom, the essence of freedom in the first place. What Islam granted to be a free society. But so this is a problem of, of, of uh, I think, uh, Muslim nowadays. And if we still continue to be like this, we will become no longer relevant because it is now an open society, nationwide, worldwide, and we still fail to address the issue of freedom. We f we we fail to upgrade the intellectual capacity of the Muslim and they become uh, uh, more Islamic. We fail to offer something uh, that can upgrade the intellectual capacity of the non-Muslim if they embrace Islam. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Faisal. Dr. Mazli. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure which question should I pick up because there are a lot of questions and I thought it has been uh, answered. But... Uh, your, your question, Awang, eh? you, you did trigger on a very important uh, position of Islam, talking about freedom. Uh, freedom is not being granted by people. God has granted us with freedom. We were born as free men and free women. Uh, so remember when uh, there was an incident during the period of Sayyidina Omar, where the son of the governor of Egypt, Amr ibn Naas, the son of Amr ibn Naas, has beaten a Coptic Christian because he, he, was, uh, he was defeated by that Coptic Christian in a game. So he, that Coptic Christian went to meet uh, the Caliph, Sayyidina Omar, and uh, you know, he lodged a report. And uh, Sayyidina Omar summoned not only the son of the governor, but the governor himself. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the pakai kayu pun tak tahu lah kan? Okay, so... The word that been used by Sayyidina Omar when he was talking to the son of the government said, Mata is ta'bat to munnas, walaqad waladatuhum ummahatuhum ahrara. He said that uh, since when you started enslaving people, when they were born as free men by the mother. So God has given us freedom. The problem is not with who, uh, how we give freedom, uh, how we give others freedom. The question is how we should not limit others' freedom how we should not prevent others from exercising their freedom or exercising their right. So that is the question that should be imposed, actually. And coming back to your question just now, you, you, you asked me about uh, state funding religious bodies, religious agencies, whatever. Even the most secular government uh, are funding religious institution. I give you an example, Singapore. Singapore is boasting about their, uh, I mean, their, 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 their status as being a secular state. But you look at MUIS, for example, it's being funded by the government, but it takes face money. And you look at United States of America, they're funding the church, the churches. UK, 
you know, the funding the church. I said, remember, even in the house of Lord, you have 16 what they call as Lord of Holies. They were appointed from the churches. So it's not about the funding. Actually, it's about the monopoly of the interpretation of Islam and imposing it onto others. That's interesting. That is the problem. The problem that we say in certain Muslim countries, if not all Muslim countries, in certain Muslim countries, even those who proclaim, self-proclaim they are a secular, laicite country, they try to impose their own interpretation of Islam onto others. For example, in Tunisia, before the revolution, or uh, Turkey, before Ak Party and what's happening now. I mean, the government, the secular government, they have their own interpretation of Islam. And they impose it onto people. They prevent their people from going to other interpretation. So that, that is the problem. The same thing here. I mean, the same thing in Saudi Arabia, the same thing in, in, in Iran, for example. They try to impose the state version of Islam into others. And actually, the question is, is not only about the, the, the domination of violence, but also it's about the domination of power. I mean, I don't want to sound very Foucauldian, but <laughs> it is not the right place to talk about Foucault. Huh? But, you know, Foucault said, uh, knowledge is power. It's not, it's not that you have knowledge and then you have power. No, but you have power, then you dictate the definition of knowledge. You define knowledge. So that is the same. In Muslim countries, the state, because they are so powerful, because they are so maximum, they are the ones who define Islam and the way people should practice Islam and not the other way around. And it comes back to Sayyidina Omar words, Mata Ista'bat Tumunnas. Yeah? And it comes back to your question. You know, you said why people have that you know, kind of contradicting uh, choice according to Pew, especially in Malaysia. In Malaysia, you have less people performing Salat, but more people want to do it. <laughs> in Indonesia, you have less people wanted to do it, but a huge number of people you know, perform observing their salat. So if it goes not only it, it goes abroad, it goes not only beyond Malaysia, my only answer is the failure of state. The failure of state in exercising their actual role. You know, what is the role of a state? To ensure rule of law, to enforce rule of law, to guard the borders, to make sure there's no crime on the streets, to make sure every single individual will be free to exercise their choice and will be safe when they're walking on the streets, when they're sitting inside their house, when they're sitting inside their vehicles. But when the government are busy doing businesses and they're failing their businesses in many cases, and they're busy accumulating wealth and and they fail they oppress the, 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 they oppose their opinion on others and they ended up oppressing their own people you have that result with you and not only that they're doing that they're just justifying that with religion they co-opting religious figures religious authorities religious institutions to legitimize whatever they are doing. And this is what wrong with religious institutions. It's not about the funding. Everybody needs a funding. But mind you, even the funding, when, when religious institutions, they are being democratized, they are being empowered, they are being owned by the society, they will be more, uh, uh, they will be more uh, successful in compared to those who are being funded by the state. Look at sick, yeah. They encourage wakaf. I've written about wakaf, yeah. When you encourage wakaf, you look at Turkey. What happened to Turkey? They have wakaf universities. They have wakaf Islamic organization. They have wakaf hum humanitarian organizations. Okay, look at our situation. Uh, coming back to your question, who did? Uh, no, uh, Faisal, you 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 did talk about uh, uh, online economy, yeah, online uh, businesses. Mind you, our society are becoming more liberal in terms of economic, but not the state. The state, although they're talking about liberalization of economy, whatever, including state of Selangor. 
<laughs> but actually, they're not really liberal in, in, in terms of economy, but the society are. Our society is becoming more liberal nowadays. You know why? They don't believe in paying tax to the government, they go for online businesses. <laughs> because by doing online businesses, they can escape the tax, am I right? Okay, meaning they're being empowered. They, be, they, they started to believe in free market economy, alhamdulillah, thanks to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> when it comes to religious, when it comes to religiosity, when it comes to religion, they are no longer believe in the sole interpretation of religion imposed by religious institutions. Mind me, they can stop even Mufti to go to the mosque in certain state. They can stop a Tiga Plonam Pendakwa from coming to certain state, they can stop certain individuals, that PU, this PU, but they cannot stop people from opening YouTube, accessing to blogs, you know, reading Facebook. And mind you, those who are watching YouTube, those who are reading the Facebook of Muti Wilaya, huh, their numbers is much bigger than those who are attending the Charama. Voluntarily, they are doing that by their own choice, without being forced, without being coerced, without being directed. So, yeah. so the conclusion is, actually our society is becoming more liberal nowadays. And nothing wrong with the word liberal. You know, just like people said, okay, because the word jihad has been demonized nowadays, so we shun away from the word jihad. We change it, no. We stand firm with the word jihad. But we need to explain the real meaning of the word jihad. The same thing when the word liberal, the word liberal had been demonized not only by those who are anti-liberal, but also with, by those who self-proclaim that they are liberal, the extremists. The extremist liberal, the extremist LGBT, the extremist this and that, secularists you mentioned, they are the ones who spoil the word liberals. They are doing everything, they are justifying whatever the, their whim wanted to do by the word liberal, which actually, which in reality, they are not really liberal. I still remember uh, uh, funny, uh, talking with, 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 with a person. Uh, he said, hey, he's a liberal, whatever, but he believed in Marxism. By no way, Marxism is liberal. <laughs> but he said, oh, I'm a liberal Muslim. He said, no, you are not. He said, why you say I'm a liberal? Because I'm a bisexual person. And I am Marxist and I am atheist. I said, no, no, sorry. That's not what liberal. And, and sometimes, Put the blame also on those who claim themselves as Islam liberal. Nah, Islam liberal ini lagi satu ini. They are corrupting the interpretation. I mean, they are corrupting the discipline of knowledge. With due respect, with due respect of their choice. But yeah, with due respect. That, but the, the the problem is when they try to impose. Okay, extremism in any way is not good. Whether you are. Islamic extremists, you are Christian extremists, you are secular extremists, even liberal extremists, it's not good. Jalaluddin Rumi used to, yeah, when he was asked about uh, what, what is poison, yeah, he said, when you, you're being excessive, you're being extreme in doing everything, yeah, that, is, yeah, that is the illness and that is the disease. Uh, so the only way is to coming back to the justly balance. It must justly Balance, uh, but people like to use the word moderate nowadays for wasatia. I, I think I I rather choose the word justly balanced uh, rather than using the word moderate because the word moderate who's moderate? Uh, because you know the the uh, Obama administration has their own interpretation interpretation of moderate Muslim. Trump administration has their own interpretation of moderate Muslim. Arab Saudi. <laughs> who preventing uh, who preventing uh, women from driving their cars and who put a lot of pro democracy scholars and activists including Dr. Yusuf Al Karadawi into terrorist list they think that they are moderate you know who's moderate even for me the word moderate nowadays is very dirty just like the word tolerant so so the wasatia is not to be interpreted as moderation but it should be interpreted as justly balanced. al kist The word wasat, it should come with it the connotation of just. Without just, there is no uh, what uh, uh, there is no wasatiya. Okay, thank you very much. So before we go to uh, 
Ali Salman for the conclusion. Uh, maybe I can add something to what Dr. Mazli said. Because when people said human rights or liberal <laughs> is, 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 a, is a Western idea, it's actually communism and other things also coming from Western. So when, when we talk about liberal to a tyrant leader, it's actually the, tyr the tyrannical action that being practiced by leaders is also coming from, not from our, it's, it's originated from other. other yeah, oh, uh, thank you, Amin. I mean, I mean uh, uh, ignited a very important thing. Uh, normally when we talk about uh, liberalism, people are pointing out that uh, John Locke as being the father of liberalism. Uh, although when it comes to liberal economy, actually it's not Locke, it's more on Hayek and <laughs> okay, Adam Smith and etc. Or Ibn Khaldun. <laughs> For me it's Ibn Khaldun. Lah. Okay. So, uh, actually, you know, one thing about John Locke, John Locke is not as liberal as you imagine. Because the word liberal nowadays people are like, when you say liberal people, okay, he must be a, a club goers, mesti dia ni, uh, apa ni, kaki minum, mesti is not religious at all, believing in free sex, like Karl Marx, okay? Or maybe he, he, he is a bisexual or LGBT. No, no, no. You know that John Locke is a very religious person. <laughs> He's a very religious person, a very devout Christian. But actually it's not about John Locke, it's about his guru. Excuse me, his teacher, Albert Pocock. He was the one who influenced John Locke with the idea of freedom. And Edward Pocock, who is Edward Pocock? He has been accused of being Muslim in disguise. Okay, you can Google the name Edward Pocock. The one who is Arabist or let we say uh, Orientalist. The word Orientalist also becoming so dirty nowadays. But is specializing in Islamic sciences and he was a professor in Oxford and he has been accused of being Muslim in disguise whatever and his specialization is in Ibn Tufail and his idea of tabula rasa he was the one who brought the idea of tabula rasa coming from the very idea of Ibn Tufail the idea of fitrah you know Ibn Tufail has written a book on Hay ben Yaqazan Amongst, you know, he has a lot of philosophy behind it, including those deviated philosophy, so-called deviated philosophy according to the mainstream. But the most important thing is, he's talking about fitrah. And when talking about fitrah, it's not only even to fail. When it comes to politics and economy, one of the most important reference in the discussion of word fitrah is Ibn Taymiyyah. Unfortunately, when we talk Ibn Taymiyyah, we imagine <laughs> about being Wahhabi or about Jihad or whatever. But this is the guy who emphasized a lot on fitra and nature born when it comes to politics. That is why Ibn Taymiyyah never talked about Khalifa. Even in his book about Siyasa Sharia, the very first page he talked about, about what? About meritocracy. Okay, so maybe our DAP friends are happy to read the time, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think that's enough, Ali. Yeah. Maybe just to add one more book, it's Thomas Jefferson's Al Quran, where he mentioned how 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 Al Quran influenced him when he drafted the the American Constitution, and also I mean when I was in in the United States, I mean people keep on mentioning that in the Harvard School of Law, there was there was a verse I mean from Al Quran in the in the in the wall about about the importance of rule of law. Yeah. So, final speakers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amin. Um, I think do after Dr. Masli, uh, that's really happened should be like the concluding remarks. But um, coming back to the um, uh, to the first question which I posed, um, what kind of society do we want to live in? Um, I think this discussion has uh, clearly outlined uh, important features of that society. Um, and um, um, in terms of whether talk about religious freedom or economic uh, freedom and political freedom, these are, uh, I think, three things which this debate has really highlighted. Uh, and this should be the, the, the key message. Um, uh, in, interestingly, um, um, the, the title and the theme of the book is, is more so on the, on the free society and and um, you know and and less about uh, liberal uh, terminology this reminds me of um, uh, of a recent uh, conversation with the with the graduate of IAUM who interviewed uh, whom I interviewed 
um, for for internship, and she was asking this question about uh, liberalism and secularism, and uh, she came for an internship and it said, you know, she said, um, well, um, uh, I'm okay if you if you say that uh, you're a secular organization, but I'm not okay if you say you're a liberal organization. <laughs> So that actually sort of uh, highlighted the sort of uh, the perception associated with the word here. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the uh, the idea, the ideas, the think tank uh, which I also work with, did a survey exactly on understanding of liberalism. In a national survey conducted, um, and uh, you know, it's it's a nationally representative uh, survey in terms of. Uh, um, uh, the ethnic background and the uh, uh, and the you know uh, religious background, and the main sort of one of the main finding is that although most of the Malaysians uh, disapprove the word liberalism, yet they do not understand the word liberalism. However, they are liberal in practice. <laughs> these, <laughs> these, this is exactly what we also highlighted. They are. But they oppose and they do not understand. Um, therefore, it it is it. Uh, I think this that there is a need of more and more discussion on mainstream media on on these discussions about um, about the words about the terms because you know they, these convey they, they do convey important meaning. Um, Masli mentioned the example of Sayyidna Umar. Uh, and I think that the terminology was used as as huria, uh, and huria uh, is is an important concept in in the Islamic thought also. Uh, if you look at some of the work which, for instance, uh, Professor Hashim Kamali has done um, here uh, in in Malaysia, um, both as a professor of IAUM and then also as the head of uh, this IAIS is very important. He has traced the word uh, hurriya and freedom in the history of Islamic thought. And uh, the definitions uh, which he has quoted are, are very strikingly closer to the idea of negative freedom and negative liberty and freedom from coercion, freedom from violence. Uh, it is not to free, it, it doesn't mean free to do something it is freedom from violence, freedom co from coercion. So that's a very important distinction uh, which he has made and which many other scholars have, have made. We also tend to um, support that definition of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of religious freedom. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, freedom uh, from religion, it is freedom of religion. So we are not emphasizing, we are not saying that we, sh we are talking about society which is free of religion, no. We are talking about a society in which there is religious freedom. There is, there is not only religious freedom but also freedom of interpretations and um, mutual coexistence. Um, so that's important. Um, about uh, the history of Muslim societies and democratization experience and then the, the preference for Sharia, I think um, times are changing. Um, if you look at um, what Huntington said in 1990s, uh, you know uh, he said that uh, the democratic politics and Islamic politics are not compatible. He sort of uh, gave a judgment uh, back in 1993. But you know, 25 years, 25 years after his sort of judgment. If you look now, this judgment uh, by someone as, as a seminal scholar as Samuel Huntington has become irrelevant because actually most of the, uh, or at least many of the Muslim societies have embraced democracy. They have become more political, uh, the, the, the extent of freedom, political freedom has increased dramatically. Uh, we could argue whether it's a question of uh, liberal democracy there or or not, but I think it's it also uh, in my view the you know the the there is a history of uh, colonialism, colonization experience, 
which Muslim societies have over the last 200 years have influenced actually the sort of knowledge being produced in the societies. And I think that's, that's also, also unfortunately uh, made us think that anything coming from the West should be, uh, should be sort of uh, rejected or should be uh, resisted at least. Which is unfortunate because as also Masli was highlighting, these concepts uh, of freedom, of hurria, um, of liberty, are not the monopoly of West. Uh, it, it's, it's a long intellectual tradition spread over centuries in which um, different civilizations have played their roles. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, now there is a material domination of, let's say, one uh, civilization, but it doesn't deny the role of the other civilizations which has, have played in the, in the creation of knowledge. I think we, we should, in my opinion, we should not be afraid of these terms, we should embrace these terms, but we should be clear in, in the definitions. Uh, what do we mean by, by, by these terms? As long as I think we are all be able, to clear, uh, be able to offer these clear concepts and definitions. And I hope that today is, um, uh, you know, we have been able to, uh, to make some, some clarity. And I really hope that we have not increase the level of confusion <laughs> which the academics and the think tanks uh, are uh, often confu uh, accused to <coughs> then I think we have done uh, a good job uh, and we look forward to work of us <laughs> so with that we end our session today and I would like to invite uh, Yang Muhammad Zuraida uh, uh, with Saudara Cairo Arifin as the uh, manager here to give some token of appreciation to our speakers. Yeah.